Following the events of September 11th, the United States led a successful invasion of Afghanistan, crippling Al-Qaeda and ousting the Taliban from power. However, neither the Taliban or Al-Qaeda had been eliminated completely. With both Mullah Omar and bin Laden escaping capture, the Americans were now left with the unenviable task of nation-building in a country ravaged by decades of war. I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian, and today we will be looking at the American occupation of Afghanistan. Before we continue, I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, World of Tanks, a free-to-play MMO PC game that puts you in command of the most iconic military vehicles from the mid-20th century. Choose from a huge arsenal of over 800 historically accurate destroyers, artillery, and light, medium, and heavy tanks from 11 nations, and enjoy the game's tactical battle mechanics and diverse strategic gameplay with five complementary vehicle classes and over 40 unique maps and multiple game modes. Roll out in open fields, sneak through forests, tear across deserts, and pick your battles in urban or industrial zones while commanding legendary tanks like the T-34 and the Sherman. New players who register today using our activation code COMBAT will receive a free Tier 6 tank, the Cromwell B Medium Tank, a 7-day World of Tanks premium account, 250,000 credits, as well as a free 10-battle rental of a Tiger 131 Heavy Tank, a T-78 Tank Destroyer, and a Type 64 Light Tank. Enter the battle and join over 160 million World of Tank fans today by clicking our link in the description below. The Taliban's fall was swift and brutal. Their fighting capability was obliterated by the Americans in a lightning war that decimated over 20% of its total forces by the end of 2002, and thoroughly destroyed the Emirate as a government entity. Despite this catastrophe, the Taliban were eager to get back on their feet forming a number of committees in 2003 known as Shiras. These councils aimed to unite their scattered cadres still left fighting by re-establishing a formal chain of command, expanding recruitment, and strengthening logistics, a task made more difficult thanks to the new occupation of their country. For the United Nations, keeping stability in Afghanistan meant denying the Taliban any opportunity to exert their influence. It was an endeavor which required the assistance of all allied nations in the coalition. It was because of this that the UN established the International Security Assistance Force following the Bonn Agreement in 2001. With NATO assuming direct control in August 2003, the ISAF expanded gradually from its base in Kabul into the rest of the country. Provincial reconstruction teams were also created from multinational elements to aid in stabilization, development, and most importantly, extending the influence of Afghanistan's central government. However, the ISAF soon began to stumble, with several issues hindering their mission. Most critical of these was the lack of understanding when it came to ethnic, tribal, and political complexities. Cooperation with the post-Taliban political order was also difficult due to rampant nepotism and tribal patronage. In contrast, the Taliban set about remobilizing their forces. Taliban leaders traveled throughout their existing constituencies all across Afghanistan and neighboring Pakistan, inviting former members and others in their family to join the new insurgency. The prospect of nation-building was not a welcome one for the Americans, nor was the idea of staying there as a counterinsurgency force. However, the military recognized a need to consolidate gains through building local support, as well as the necessity for counterterrorism. The mission was clear, neutralize all militants associated with Al-Qaeda and find bin Laden. U.S. and Allied Special Forces now turned to counterterrorism operations, utilizing the same task forces involved in the initial invasion, while also establishing newer and more specialized groups to help find targets across Afghanistan and Pakistan. While effective, these operations did have their downside. U.S. operators often mistakenly lumped Taliban leaders together with Al-Qaeda, despite any distinction or clear allegiances. By their own admission, special operations forces at the time neglected careful intelligence. They were anxious to prosecute whatever leads came, no matter how questionable the source. Analysts who warned that intelligence might be faulty were often overruled. 
In the experience of one Special Forces team, they recall, a lot of operations ended with us capturing low-level leaders or people who were associated with the Taliban. I don't think we ever caught anybody who was a confirmed Al-Qaeda member. Rather, they were low-level Taliban operatives. Meanwhile, the ISAF was forced to contend with renewed offensives from the Taliban insurgency, who had grown more brazen thanks to the motivation of their new recruits and jihadist militants, spurred on by a fatwa issued by the Taliban in 2005 ordering the death of all infidels and others who supported the Afghan government. Between March and July, insurgents targeted Canadian ISAF soldiers throughout Kandahar and massed near Kandahar City for a major attack. British ASAF soldiers faced constant combat in northern Helmand province over the summer period. However, the Taliban were too self-assured and underestimated the ISAF, who fought back against many of these offensives and inflicted significant casualties. Despite ISAF success, the increase of Taliban offensives raised issues of the coalition's lack of military footprint. By 2006, their expansion into the south of Afghanistan confirmed fears that their budgetary focus on reconstruction and development had allowed a full-blown insurgency to establish itself across subregions like Pashmul. In response, NATO launched the first conventional land battle in its history on September 1st, codenamed Operation Medusa. Described by General David Julian Richards as a Second World War-style battle for Kandahar. The two-week operation saw Canadian, US, and Afghan combat forces assaulting Taliban defensive positions with the assistance of British, Danish, Dutch, and French combat support. The operation was tactically successful, with hundreds of insurgent casualties and no major Taliban operations that year. However, the coalition forces were hampered by national governments representing their forces, intervening on critical decisions, and hindering necessary support, which revealed direct limitations on the coalition's efficiency. From 2006 to 2008, coalition forces in Afghanistan grew from 9,000 to 51,000 troops, with NATO using the success of operations like Medusa to adapt with the changing conflict. By 2008, the ISAF footprint encompassed the whole country, though a major shortfall in their operation was a continued national unwillingness to commit the full resources necessary for success. It was a concern that would continue to hamper the Americans even during their transition to the new Obama administration. President Barack Obama quickly soured on the Afghan mission, being especially wary of the costs and uncertainty involved. Initially, Obama opted to raise U.S. troop levels in Afghanistan above the 100,000 mark for a limited period, though he made it clear that U.S. force levels from that high point would only go down. Strategy also changed as the increased use of remote drone missions took priority over the buildup of conventional land forces. Whereas the Bush administration authorized 52 drone strikes outside the war theater in an eight-year period, the Obama administration authorized more than 10 times that number, with 542 drone strikes killing almost 3,800 people from their kill or capture list. Suffice to say, the change in approach was controversial, with the use of signature strikes and other tactics garnering much criticism. Despite this, Obama was convinced it was the right approach, insisting, this is a just war. Doing nothing is not an option. As the larger coalition built up in the region, resurgent Taliban attacks led to the ISAF launching a number of key operations, all involving NATO and Afghan security forces throughout 2010 onwards. The most prominent among these included Operation Moshtarik, a 15,000-strong force tasked with pacifying subregions of Helmand province. Operation Hamkari, aimed at securing Kandahar City and connecting its key districts, and the more famous Operation Neptune Spear, a controversial CIA-led mission to capture Osama bin Laden. This daring helicopter raid occurred on May 2, 2011, when U.S. Navy SEALs entered bin Laden's Abbottabad compound in Pakistan, eliminating him almost as soon as they gained entry. 
Despite criticisms of Obama's policy up to this point, few Americans objected to bin Laden's death, which ended a decade-long manhunt following his escape from Tora Bora back in 2001. In July 2011, the president affirmed his withdrawal of troops, marking 2014 as the year of transition and 2016 as the deadline by which all U.S. forces would be withdrawn. In 2015, just over 9,800 troops were present. Yet this introduced a problem, as the performance of Afghan security forces showed that they were not ready to pick up the slack from the departing U.S. troops. As international forces left, the Taliban regained the initiative, having expanded dramatically since 2003 despite their setbacks. Military intelligence estimated the number of Taliban fighters inside Afghanistan to be around 30,000 insurgents throughout 2010 to 2012. By 2015, their manpower had reached over 200,000 men, just a year after the ISAF had been disbanded. When the Taliban seized the city of Kunduz in September, Obama was forced to scrap plans to withdraw all U.S. troops by the end of his term. Meanwhile, the death of Mullah Omar back in 2013 also led to the rise of succeeding commanders like Akhtar Muhammad Mansour, who was able to consolidate power and take control of the Taliban, though his stint was brief, having been killed in a drone strike authorized by the president. This led to Hiptullah Akhwansada succeeding as the leader of the Taliban in May 2016, one month after the initiation of their own spring offensive, codenamed Operation Omari. Operation Omari involved capturing and holding major cities across Afghanistan. Despite successfully breaching the frontline defense of the Afghan National Security Forces and controlling a significant number of districts, their offensive was blunted thanks to U.S. air power and special operation forces. Attempts to further seize strategic Afghan cities were thwarted by the combined U.S. and Afghan security forces, resulting in high Taliban casualties. Although Operation Omari revealed severe weaknesses in the Afghan armed forces, they did not bring the Taliban any closer to winning the war. American counterattacks and support prevented the Taliban from achieving their objectives and highlighted the limitations of their frontal assaults. By January 2017, the direction of U.S. strategy in Afghanistan would once again change, as Donald Trump assumed presidency. Trump was profoundly skeptical of foreign interventions, though he was committed to decisive action against terrorism, having criticized Obama's methodical strategy to defeat the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. He vowed to crush terrorism while refocusing resources on the United States. In September, U.S. Defense Secretary James Mattis acknowledged the challenges faced in Afghanistan, with the Taliban controlling 40% of the country and a third of its population. The Trump administration conducted a review and developed a strategy aiming to compel the Taliban to negotiate for peace. From early 2018 to 2020, a series of failed ceasefires and renewed fighting alternated behind official arrangements between the U.S., Afghan government, and Taliban forces to negotiate peace. In February 2020, a peace deal was signed in Qatar before a large audience of diplomats from across the world. The president was satisfied with the Taliban's commitment, though he wasn't around to see its completion following his defeat in the 2020 elections. With Joe Biden assuming presidency in January 2021, the national mood had soured on military intervention thanks to domestic issues such as the coronavirus pandemic and its subsequent economic downturn. On July 8, 2021, the president announced the full withdrawal of military forces from Afghanistan, intending to honor the U.S. Taliban agreement set by his predecessor. Inadvertently, this commitment gave Taliban commanders an opportunity to seize on, culminating in a rapid strategy of coercion and persuasion which saw many Afghan security forces surrendering to the Taliban as they advanced on the capital. With these surrender deals, the last remnants of the U.S.-backed central government had effectively handed over entire provincial commands to their adversaries and put the militants back into power two decades after they were defeated by the United States and its allies. On August 14, 2021, the Taliban entered the capital of Kabul with barely a shot fired, 
A total of 122,000 people were evacuated from Afghanistan in one of the largest airlifts in history. U.S. casualties in the war included 2,500 killed and over 20,000 wounded. Taliban casualties were greater, with roughly 100,000 killed and 150,000 wounded. Finally, the civilian toll was more than 120,000 killed and wounded, with many more becoming displaced as a result of the war. After almost 20 years of conflict, the Afghan war stands to be the longest and one of the most disastrous in American history. Thanks again to World of Tanks. Click our link in the description, register today using our activation code COMBAT, and receive a free Tier 6 tank, the Cromwell B medium tank, a 7-day World of Tanks premium account, 250,000 credits, as well as a free 10 battle rental of a Tiger 131 heavy tank, a T-78 tank destroyer, and a Type 64 light tank.